from NBC News World Headquarters in New York. The worldwide battle against landmines came to the nation's capital today. As NBC's Nora O'Donnell reports, the activists want U.S. support. In Washington today, a push for the U.S. to sign an international treaty to ban deadly landmines. I want you to look at these young people. These are the young people, the future generations of activists who understand that you work toward peace every single day. All it takes is one false step in a minefield. It happened to me one day, looking down and being disconnected from your body. Life has changed forever. It becomes part of your life. It is behind your house. Every day you go out and you're tiptoeing, not knowing exactly when your leg is going to be exploded. People who are walking to their wells to fetch water. People who are trying to cultivate their farms. People who have mines all around their houses and are afraid to even step outside their front yard. The Ottawa Ban Treaty actually came into force faster than any other arms treaty in history as a result of a coalition of governments and non-governmental organizations that recognized in the field that landmines, in fact, provided an extraordinary humanitarian catastrophe. Ordinary people. I'm going to try to explain how a bunch of ordinary people around the world came together to eventually eliminate landmines and make it a reality. We mounted an advocacy campaign um, we started a letter writing campaign directed at the American government because we wanted them to clean up the mess. We said we didn't have landmines in Kenya, but we wanted to plant landmines in people's minds. And then I uh, make one uh, report, give to the people and Cambodian. If they support, they can sign. And after that, we collect uh, more than million signature. Certainly, Princess Diana brought a different element to the campaign, to the movement. She recognized that the media followed her everywhere, that she could take them with her into the minefields. She could give a living face to the victims. We had governments begin to recognize that this was an issue that was growing in concern around the world. And they began to compete for leadership on this issue of global humanitarian concern. That was the first time, to my knowledge, the NGOs were sitting at the negotiating table which was a tremendous factor. We were the experts from the field. We were the experts with the documentation. We knew what we were talking about, and they could not disregard us. So we decided to, to take the risk to uh, issue a challenge, which broke most of the normal conventions, the way you do things. To use that old expression, we rolled the dice on a Friday night. They said, not only are we going to do this, we're going to do it in open, complete partnership with the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, and they're going to be inside the negotiations. We achieved a total ban treaty in one year, five from the launch of the campaign. The coalition of small and medium-sized countries can very actively, together with the civil society, with NGOs, achieve something that most of the usual big players we're not very keen to have. The real prize for this campaign is the treaty, of course, the Ottawa Treaty, um, you know, which was given birth when Foreign Minister Atsworthy made the challenge to the world. The signing of the treaty is just the beginning. There's a lot of work going on about where the international campaign will go from here. Uh, the work won't be finished until all the mines have gone. After this treaty was signed, the hard work came, and uh, we needed to have ensure more countries were joining and that they were respecting their obligations. We have followed the treaty all over the world, encouraging, commenting, criticizing. We set up the Landmine Monitor, the worldwide research network, to check on progress states were making. We've been to many places, Colombia, Kenya, Jordan, Cambodia, the United Nations in Switzerland, in New York, to Mozambique, Nicaragua, Thailand, and in other many other places. Congratulations to all of us, because we are still here and still working to make the mind ban a reality in the poorest countries. I thank the mind ban community for thinking about small people like me who lost our legs. Oh, um, oh, I.
here in Cartagena, Colombia, and we are all here for the uh, same purpose, for encouraging our governments to honor their commitments to the Mind Ban Treaty, and more especially to make the lives of survivors much better than what it has been before. When the campaign started in 1992, more than 20,000 people were being killed or maimed by landmines worldwide every year. Now it's just over 4,000 people, a huge drop. But it's still every day, someone, somewhere, fall victims to these indiscriminate weapons. Around 20 countries have been declared mine-free, one for every year of the campaign. We will not stop until there is not one more new victim, not one more mine ever laid. Millions have been declared, thousands of kilometers of saved land released to people desperately in need of it. More than 45 million stockpiled landmines have been destroyed thanks to the Mine Ban Treaty. The Mind Ban Treaty is working, but it cannot work on its own. Our members around the world have been campaigning tirelessly, and now, 20 years on, we've got 80% of the world on board, and minds are becoming a relic of the past. Join the world. Join that great voice that shouts, no more landmines. Land your leg. Land your leg. Join us. The ICBL is a fully grown campaign of ordinary people in some hundred countries around the world that do extraordinary work of pushing for a mind-free world, bit by bit, every day. We are closer than ever before, and we won't stop until we reach our goal. Not one more. We are challenging all of you today to stay and finish the job of getting the world rid of landmines once and for all in years, not decades to come. Good evening, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm very moved by this movie. I, I'm sure I'm not the only one. I uh, can't help remembering some of uh, the events that you saw, some of the action that we all took jointly over these years um, that brought us where we are today. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight to celebrate. Sorry, um, I saw it many times, but still. Uh, to celebrate the 20th year of the ICBL, uh, responding to our invitations. Uh, you're here today, representative of governments, civil society, UN agencies, many other international organizations as a symbol of the partnership that brought us together where we are. Uh, my name is Sylvie Brigovillain and I am the, now the executive director of the ICBL CMC. Uh, but I started campaigning against landmines in 1993. And uh, I think I have uh, learned and worked with many of you uh, in this room and learned from you all and many others as well outside of this room that we need to think of. Um, and um, in my years with Handicap International, then with the ICBL that I had the privilege to uh, lead until last year, 
And um, I think tonight we wanted the ICBL to celebrate its 20th birthday by taking actions and uh, with you all. And I'm sure that uh, what you will hear in a moment will inspire you more uh, to help us uh, reach our goal of a mind-free world, uh, working further on humanitarian disarmament more generally, and, um, and help us yeah, finishing the job. Um, I'm going to just now give the floor to Dr. Lawrence, Chair of the Board of the Physicians for Human Rights, and, um, and who, help, uh, who will introduce us with uh, the rest of the evening. I wish you all a very, very nice evening, and wish that uh, you stay with us at the reception afterwards and uh, discuss us more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Uh, let me add my words of welcome. There has been dramatic improvement over the last 20 years. Uh, deaths from tens of thousands to a few thousand. Agricultural lands that were once off limits are now open to alleviate hunger and food insecurity. Uh, as Gandhi famously said after being asked how he got rid of the British Raj, he said, first they ignored us, then they laughed at us, then they fought us, then we won. We're now in the winning phase, almost there. My own government, sadly, still has not signed and ratified this treaty, but the work does go on an enormous amount has been accomplished. It's my privilege to introduce a very distinguished panel, and as they come up to the stage, I'm going to introduce the moderator, and he will in turn introduce each of the panelists. We're really privileged to have Stuart Hughes here. Uh, Stuart is an international journalist with the BBC with more than a decade of experience. Uh, he himself is a landmine survivor. In 2003, while covering the war in Iraq, uh, he stepped on a landmine that had been planted by uh, Saddam Hussein's forces. It killed his cameraman, and it led to the amputation of Stuart's right leg. He is now, this year, the Ochberg Fellow at uh, the Columbia School of Journalism and continues to keep a sharp eye on international developments. So, Stuart, will you please uh, come and introduce your fellow panelists? And I should add, in the interest of full disclosure, that I'm also a patron of the Mines Advisory Group, one of whose representatives is here this evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to uh, celebrate and mark the 20th anniversary of the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. Twenty years ago, this month, six non-governmental organizations met here in New York and issued a direct call for action. Their goal, to bring about an international ban on the use, production, stockpiling, and sale of anti-personnel landmines. They demanded greater support for landmine clearance efforts, mine risk education, and to help the victims of landmines. 20 years ago here in New York, the ICBL was born. I'm going to quote two of our panelists to give a sense of the scale of the challenge that the ICBL faced in its infancy. Steve Goose and Jody Williams have written that the odds were long, the obstacles immense, the process fragile, and the outcome extremely uncertain. This was not diplomacy as usual. This was civil society leading the mobilization of grassroots campaigners, galvanizing public opinion, and lobbying governments for change. As Jody Williams has said, NGOs didn't wait for anyone to appoint them leaders to this issue. They saw a critical problem. They knew it had to be addressed, and they took it up. And despite the long odds and the immense obstacles, five years later, the Ottawa Treaty was adopted and opened for signature, and shortly afterwards, the ICBL and its first coordinator, Jody Williams, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It was, in the words of the Nobel Committee, proof that the impossible is possible. 160 nations, representing some 80% of the world's states, are now signatories to the Mind Ban Treaty, but, as we've already heard, a number of notable countries still outside it, and that's an issue we're going to talk about tonight. 
it's only right as we mark the 20th anniversary of the ICBL that we reflect on the achievements of the past two decades, and they have been remarkable. But I would stress now, this is not an evening for backslapping, and it's not an evening for self-congratulation. I hope today we'll also be able to raise some difficult questions, uncomfortable questions, in a spirit of constructive debate, so that in the years ahead, the ICBL and its sister campaign, the Cluster Munition Coalition, can remain focused and energized and dedicated to continuing its work. So with me this evening, a distinguished panel to discuss some of those difficult questions. Two panelists I've already referred to, Jody Williams, on my right, founding coordinator of the International Campaign to Ban Landmines and a 1997 Peace Prize laureate, and Steve Goose, Executive Director of the Arms Division of Human Rights Watch and a founding member of the ICBL. Joining them, Firas Ali Alizadi, on my right, Campaign Manager for the ICBL, Jean-Baptiste Richardier, co-founder and executive director of Handicap International. Nick Rosevere, chief executive of the UK-based mine clearance charity, the Mines Advisory Group. And Susanna Serkin, deputy director of Physicians for Human Rights. And you also have an opportunity to put your questions to the panel. Some of you may have already submitted questions, which we will return to in a little while. And if you're in the audience or watching the live stream on the internet, you can ask questions and express your views on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag BanLandmines20. And if you are on Twitter, I would encourage you to express your opinion, opinions while the debate is underway, and I will be watching that hashtag for the opinions that come in. Uh, we are running a little bit late, so I hope to get us all with a drink in our hands by 7.45 at the latest, <laughs> or thereabouts. Uh, Jody, I want to start with you by, by looking back at the, the birth of the campaign. I said this isn't an evening for self-congratulation but I will permit you one moment of, of self-indulgence. Um, what are your memories from, from the early days of the campaign? You were setting out to, to, achieve a camp, uh, to achieve something you knew was fraught with difficulties and obstacles. Did you appreciate then what you were getting yourself into? To be honest, I didn't even know I was going to be invited to create a campaign banning landmines. Can you all hear me? I was working at that point uh, with my 11th year on Nicaragua and El Salvador trying to stop U.S. military intervention. We failed um, miserably. However, uh, I was burned out and looking for a different job, um, was not having success finding one. And all of a sudden I got a call from Tomas Gebauer of Medico International, which is a humanitarian organization in Germany. And I knew Tomas from working together in El Salvador. And it was very odd, he called me. I never talked to him on the phone. I hate the phone. But he called and he asked if I'd pick him up to the airport, from the airport and then take him to a meeting with Bobby Muller, who was a Vietnam vet and the, um, he was the director at that time of the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation, which has been renamed a few times, so I don't know what he's called now. Um, but those two were supposedly having a meeting. I brought a book and I thought I could just sit, you know, and then not have to listen to them and then take Thomas to the airport and I'd go home. Instead, they made me come into the room with them. And they started talking to each other about this project they had in Cambodia where they were training former combatants from the four different fighting groups to make prosthetic limbs. So they're yapping at each other and I'm, I kept thinking, why the hell am I here? Why can't I be out reading my book? And then uh, the long and short of it is they finally got to their point and said that they thought that the only solution was to ban landmines. And they asked if I thought I could help create an international campaign to ban landmines. And, uh, you know, I, my first response was, I think, similar to what many people said in the beginning, it's like, why are you bothering with landmines? Why don't you tackle a real weapon? Why don't you go after nukes? And I said that to Mueller, and he explained to me the difference between landmines, which once they're in the ground can stay there for 100 years and, you know, kill your great, great, great grandchildren and other conventional weapons. It took me about 37 seconds to understand that. And since I was burned out on Central America, I thought it'd be a fantastic challenge. But in all honesty, um, I had no idea how long it might take to uh, get the, you know, a treaty banning the weapon. 
it really, that really wasn't on my personal radar screen at the time. What I mostly thought was if we can create some sort of movement that raises awareness and helps some people somewhere in the world who are having to live with landmines, how great is that? And so just on that alone, I thought, well, why not? Let's see what happens. And so I accepted. Here we are 20 years later. Steve, you were there at the start. How do you turn a bunch of people with good intentions, do good as if you want to uh, be slightly uh, patronizing towards them, into uh, uh, an organization, a civil society initiative that can actually sit at the top table with diplomats and say, we're not going to accept diplomacy as usual. We're going to do things differently. We're going to do things a different way. It took us a long time to get to the point where it took a long time for us to get to the point where we were talking to diplomats in a cooperative fashion. In the early years of the campaign, we're really all about um, hitting at the governments and hitting at the governments hard and hitting at the militaries hard and trying to educate them about the dangers of landmines and why they were unique weapons that had to be addressed in a serious fashion. Uh, it was only after many years of this sort of educational process and what I sometimes refer to as kicking the diplomats uh, in the shins, that we were able to start generating uh, a core group of governments who were like-minded, who were thinking the same way that we were, that the only way to really address this weapon was to ban it comprehensively. And this was a, a key moment for us uh, in the campaign and didn't really come along until 1995, uh, late 1995, where we came to the realization that if we're going to get a treaty banning these weapons, we have to work with governments. We have to find partners. Uh, and this was hard to take for many of the people in the campaign. There were those who only wanted to work in opposition to governments and thought that we'd be co-opted and that we would lose our way. Mm. Well, it didn't turn out that way, but there were plenty of fights about it. Uh, one of the other lessons about this campaign is uh, you can have a lot of fights and still end up uh, in the right place. A lot of creative tension uh, was, is what made this campaign work. Susanna, what are your reflections from, from the, that moment where you realized that governments and civil society were going to have to sit down and, and try and find a way of working together? Yeah, well, I think I, I'd first like to remember what that civil society looked like that we uh, marshaled together in the early years. For Physicians for Human Rights, we and Asia Watch, had, which was later to become part of the, human, uh, the whole organization Human Rights Watch, had gone um, to Cambodia um, right at the time when uh, many tens of thousands of refugees on the Thai border who had been there for uh, almost two decades were getting ready to be sent back to basically a massive minefield. And the documentation of the horrific, egregious injuries, and in particular, um, what Dr. Jim Kobe, who worked with us then and did this research, who's sitting in the front row here, um, did with um, PHR and Human Rights Watch in, in, in this book, The Coward's War, which for us launched our view that this uh, weapon was simply unacceptable. The detail of the, of the data uh, that, there were, that there were one in 236 Cambodians who were landmine amputees um, was something that just struck us as completely unacceptable. And people have said that this issue of landmines and the launch of the campaign, we, we had certain advantages. We were at the, it was the right issue, uh, the right time, and the right people. And because uh, there were people in the countries who were deeply affected, there were humanitarian organizations, there were uh, medical organizations, there were disarmament organizations, uh, there were human rights organizations, we all converged. It was quite remarkable. Uh, that we could all agree from wh whether we were sitting in the countries that made the mines uh, or whether we were sitting in the countries that were affected by the mines, there was this very unique collaboration and that was the civil society that grew to the size and weight and heft and um, significance that we could indeed be at the table with governments. And, and so for me that was, was what was extraordinary about those early years. And, um, you know, Steve is talking about the period when we realized, you know, we've got to get out of this conventional weapons convention process. It was ridiculous. It was slow. It wasn't really going to ever get a ban for us and move out to something completely different and different way of working. But in the first few years, it was really to galvanize a, a, a global movement and that could be at that table. And what was also um, unique in terms of that civil society government 
um, encounter was that we had masses who were out in the streets and literally marching uh, through their, across their countries, uh, um, and, and also people like Steve uh, and um, Jody and, and many others who were in the room looking at all of the, the legal uh, disarmament issues. Jean-Baptiste, you knew better than most just what these weapons were doing to people. You were out there on the ground seeing the injuries, seeing the amputations and the lost lives. Well, even before then, I was uh, acting as a, an obstetrician for Médecins Sans Frontières for one year, and I witnessed the uh, uh, daily uh, ordeal of uh, people coming from, from the border uh, after the curfew. Uh, when the curfew was lifted, those who had survived overnight would reach uh, the uh, surgery. Um, that lasted for one year, and I reflected a lot on this issue. Later on, I was invited to become the director for what became, later on, Handicap International. And for n nearly 10 years, we repaired bodies. We repaired the wounds. We, we entered what we call rehabilitation. Uh, but for nearly 10 years, we didn't realize that uh, this was about um, a, a certain conception of human rights. It took us some time to realize that. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, well, we had about 6,000 amputees along the border. We knew uh, that uh, early 81, uh, there were another 25,000 in Cambodia alone. Um, so we started to realize that the, the debate about legitimate violence was, uh, was cheating us. We, 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 we started to realize that uh, uh, collateral damages was a, were, were a lie. And uh, one of the strengths of the uh, campaign has uh, been to put together data to uh, make that a public health issue, yeah. to demonstrate to the media, to the uh, um, moral leaders, to the diplomats, that um, there was nothing acceptable in such a program slaughter of human beings at, in peacetime. But you know, whatever is uh, related to conventional weapon is extremely difficult to address. Uh, there is secret, there is secret uh, gathering, secret negotiation. There is a, a common understanding among the superpower to avoid challenging each other on those uh, sort of things. So that was the balance of uh, horror. Firoz, while this civil society campaign was coming together, you were in school in Afghanistan, and you were really one of the people that these people were working for, because at the age of 14, you became uh, a victim of a landmine. Were you aware of the extent of the problem? Were you aware that what was going on in the corridors of power that this campaign was coming together? Um, no. In age of 14, I had no idea what is landmine. I grew up in war. I knew what is war and what is weapon but I could not distinguish between a landmine or a RPG or a rocket. Um, that was, um, when I stepped on a landmine, then I, I get to know that, well, I'm not in the military, I'm just you know, a school a student, and, and how come I, I lost my legs? In, in, the first, in the first place, I did not expect to, to survive. I lost both legs and injured the left hand. It was a miracle that I survived after long hours of bleeding and so on. No first aid, no proper health, uh, um, rehabilitation and so on. But um, right after when I survived and when I got out of the hospital, I wanted to do something. I started to, to advocate for, for rights and needs of my fellow survivors and victims and people with disability. But I had no idea of that there is a campaign, there is a treaty, um, there is a process, there is a global movement that, uh, that understand me and my feeling and uh, banning landmines. In, in um, 2005, then I, through Handicap International, I, I get to know that there is a treaty, there is a campaign. A and then I was, it was, I, I was really feeling that it is my, my place, I have to go and I have, to, I have to, to get in touch with the campaign and that's how I came up to get engaged and I have 
So it's very honored to be with this company. So at the age of 14, as a, a landmine survivor in Afghanistan, what, looking forward, did you think your future was going to be as a person with disabilities in, in Afghanistan? I felt that um, I will not achieve my dreams. I had lost everything. I feel that I'm totally a burden to my family. They have uh, spent whatever saving they had to, to treat me. It was quite a dark, dark period in the beginning. But uh, thanks to my family and some friends and fellows, they, um, they keep encouraging me that no, uh, if you lost limbs, you, you, have, um, you have different ways to continue your life. And um, yeah, still I feel in trauma sometimes. Um, but I'm one of the few lucky people, and we are one of the you know, lucky people of uh, thousands of landmine survivors that we are here and we are, have this privilege of working for this campaign, personally. Um, yeah, we are joint members of a club that nobody would really want to be a member of, I think <laughs> it's probably fair to say. In the beginning, the first landmine survivors I remember you saw on the film, it was Toon Chanareth in the wheelchair from Cambodia and Song Kosal, the young woman who you saw speaking before an audience. And they were the first ones that, that we met that really wanted to become advocates and that wanted to speak out because they knew what it was like and they wanted to be a voice, they wanted to be in the face of the diplomat. It was too easy for the diplomats sitting in the beautiful meeting halls in Switzerland, overlooking the lake with the beautiful Alps behind them, and not having to deal with the reality of people living in the minefield. And that used to make me so enraged. There was a time I wanted to be able to go into their conference room, pick up their conference table and put it in the middle of an unmarked minefield and tell them they could not come out until they banned the weapon instead of thinking if they modified a paragraph by changing a comma to a semicolon they'd done a hell of a day's work you know but it was part of that rage and and righteous indignation at the indignity of people sitting in those places and hiding behind diplomatic language and the military hiding behind doctrine instead of the reality of how those weapons are used on the ground that helped us really galvanize public opinion but also reach out and make connection with governments that shared the desire to ban landmines as much as we did. And we should add, Jody, that, we, that, that concept generated one of the more effective techniques that we used, which was a simulated minefield in all over the world. And I'll never forget standing in below zero weather in Boston next to the, our mayor, making him walk across a simulated minefield with mag deminers in the middle of Copley Square. Um, but, but the notion was, it sounds funny, but the seriousness of this was that it, it somehow at least brought forward the sort of grotesque unpredictability and horror and randomness of this weapon. Nick. In uh, 92, I had nothing to do with the movement to ban landmines. Uh, I was not directly engaged. I arrived in Mozambique a couple of months after the peace accords had been signed. And I was radioing around, as we did, uh, to the different bases in different provinces and introducing myself to, the, to our provincial coordinators. And one of them had sent a, <clears throat> a message to say that he couldn't be there because we had, uh, there had just been an incident next to a bridge that we were reconstructing that had been burnt down during the war in order to in facilitate movement of people back in the returns of uh, refugees. And indeed, two of the workers on the bridge had been uh, injured, or one of them had died and the other had been injured as they, as they went into the bush beside the bridge. There was no mapping. It was nuisance mining, if you like. It, it was, uh, there were, un the, the nature of the conflict between Frelimo and Renamo had been uh, haphazard and chaotic and had ebbed and flowed, washed across the countryside. And there were hundreds and hundreds 
of people who had survived but received no treatment, received no prosthetics, received no, that survived, uh, I don't know how, uh, but had survived and uh, uh, had m enormous needs to be met. Oxfam in those days was working very closely, therefore, with Handicap International and, in fact, with Halo Trust, who were the uh, largest of the uh, operators in the country. And we were tasking Halo Trust and we were telling them where the returnee flows were coming. We were explaining to them which villages we felt were the priorities and which community assets were the priorities and where people were already building their houses on return and farming or clearing land that they had not had access to for years. And it was a, it was a game of, uh, it was a dreadful, lethal game of roulette, really, for returnees who needed to start feeding themselves uh, and needed to start accommodating their families and resettling. The work with Handicap, I was recalling this with Jean-Baptiste, was, was um, the prosthetics uh, centre uh, uh, that uh, Handicap were running in, um, Kelimán, and the flow was constant. We started to do radio broadcasts to bring people down, and the flow was constant of people coming down to Kelimán. And, uh, and many of the aid agencies working in the area provided transport and all the rest of it, and, and uh, subsistence. What we didn't realize was that whilst we were busy doing this in 92, 93, up in rural Gurue and Altamalokwe in Mozambique, was that a campaign was being established and was starting to mobilize and starting to uh, raise awareness and consciousness about, about the needs internationally. And that was an extraordinary thought. When it, when it finally, when the news reached us, it was a very, very uh, inspiring and motivating moment. And we realized that there were others out there who were mobilizing something that was going to address what was happening. And, uh, so in 97, after a number of years, when the fourth international conference was held in Maputo, it was a, it was a tremendous moment. And the Mozambican government and the South African government uh, both signed up. Um, it was a, a moment of extraordinary liberation and progress for the country, but a real breakthrough for development. Stephen Jody, once the mobilization was underway, Canada showed leadership early on in wanting to fast track this treaty through. Do you think in retrospect, though, you could have or should have done more to keep the Clinton administration on board, to create a treaty that the US could. You're rolling your eyes, Jody. go on. I she am wants famous. shot at that one, I can tell. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, I won't repeat what I said on the day of receiving the Nobel Peace Prize about Mr. Clinton. Um, no, you know, I, I still get really agitated when people think that international law does not matter unless the United States is part of it, um, especially today when we're undermining it with extrajudicial executions by drones, but that's another issue. Um, we thought about it a lot. We talked about it a lot. And the countries we wanted on board that treaty were the ones where people were being blown up. We, they were the, the most important to us, to have them be on board, to have them be destroying their stockpiles, to being committed to taking the mines out of the ground. You know, it wasn't likely the US would mine the country. Um, so we weren't so worried about that. And for me, it really helped, I don't know, galvanize something in me about trying to get people to understand that each and every country is important. And it isn't just the United States. And that was one of the marvelous things about the core group of smaller and mid-sized countries that said that essentially by coming together because it was essentially the U.S. that had a big hand in stopping any activity inside the U.N. negotiations. And so when the smaller and mid-sized countries came together, it was awesome. You know, it was finally governments coming together and saying, we don't have to wait for these people, you know? And then, and there was the huge support of the campaign. So it, to me, it was totally liberating. I was like, yes! But I've been fighting the, Viet the US since the Vietnam War, so Steve. I have a long history of fr frustration. Which you can hear in her voice maybe just a little bit. Um, Jody's absolutely correct that the US was not our top priority, that we had other priorities that we thought would make a bigger difference uh, in dealing with the impact of the weapon. But we tried awfully hard to bring the US on board from the very beginning. I mean, many of you know that 
Clinton was, in fact, the first world leader to call for the eventual elimination of anti-personnel mines. Did it right here in New York at the UN. Uh, unfortunately, it was all about eventual and not about elimination uh, as, it, as it came to be. But we tried very hard in very creative ways uh, to bring the U.S. on board. And they made a bad choice to stay away from the development of the treaty, to, to stay away from the early negotiating sessions. Same mistake they made later uh, with the cluster munition convention. Then they showed up uh, at the negotiations. And they showed up with a, a, a long list of five interlocking demands, red lines for them. And we talked about it a lot as a campaign and went and talked to all of our partners, uh, partner governments. And we all believed that the integrity of the treaty was more important than getting the US on board. That the kinds of exceptions they wanted for certain types of mines, for South Korea, for a uh, nine-year transition period, they had a long list of demands that would have completely gutted the meaning and strength of the treaty. And we made a very conscious decision that the integrity of the treaty, making sure that we had a good, strong treaty, uh, was much more important than bringing aboard certain countries or more countries. And this was something that was articulated by Axworthy, Foreign Minister Axworthy from Canada as well, when he made the challenge to negotiate the treaty in a year, he said, and if four countries show up and sign with Canada, that will be fine, because we'll start to establish the new standard. Uh, of course, in the end, we got 122 governments that signed. The U.S. was not there. And in the long run, it hasn't made much difference. The treaty has had all the successes, despite the fact that the U.S. hasn't been there. The U.S. has felt the power of the stigma against the weapon. The U.S. has felt the power of the new standard that we've established. So it hasn't used the weapon in 20 years since this campaign started. But Steve, that, that, that was not that easy um, at one point. Uh, remember Oslo, September 97? when the, 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 the rule of the game um, it was a near breakdown, yes. was uh, to call for a break if uh, the U.S. would call, or, or any member. And the U.S. called for a two days break, I, I, if I remember well. And um, Clinton, Albright, Chikashvili started to uh, call all the presidents of the world, or proxies to them, uh, rumors goes that uh, Clinton uh, woke up Mandela at midnight to put pressure on each given government to say either you bow uh, to our demand or we leave the negotiation. And at the same time, I remember as well that uh, IT was doing its uh, good, first goods. We received at the headquarters in both the UK and France uh, warnings that the, the Canadians had been uh, weakening their, their position and that there was an absolute need for uh, the UK and France to come in support of the strong, the integrity of the treaty. And the, the last detail which tells you how much this treaty has become the reflection of um, one state, one voice, was when the Canadian um, told us confidentially tell the African countries not to follow us anymore. Tell them to follow Belgium. And the work of ICBL was to spread the, wor the word all around. And of course, the African countries who had absolutely no connection with their headquarters and no way to decide what to do. And that created a very strong front of African countries, um, well, to oppose uh, the the dictatorship of superpower. So this is one of the features of this treaty as well. I want to look ahead to the present and the future. Um, so a couple of quick questions before we uh, leave the past in the past. Susanna, you, some people have said that the ICBL got lucky in a way. We've been given a sense of the extent of the humanitarian problem you were facing. Um, but there was a rising revulsion uh, of the use of the weapons and, and, and obviously a, a level of will in governments to do something about it. Is, is that a fair analysis that you just took advantage of a window of opportunity that you were in the right place at the right time? I, I think there was a lot more initiative and creativity than that. Yes, we were in the right place at the right time because of what, what we've mentioned and the fact that in so many, uh, on all the continents where landmines were uh, at epidemic levels and, and, and where there were movements of refugees in post-conflict environments, there was a huge attention to this, but I think uh, it was really the creativity of this campaign 
so many innovations in the methods we used, uh, the way of collaborating with a whole range of organizations, having a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and I want to acknowledge the, those who, who early on invested in this. It, it's not easy to get money for advocacy, mm -hmm. uh, as yeah. those of us who continue to do many <laughs> advocacy campaigns can uh, testify to. And, and the fact that um, you know, George Soros and others invested early in some governments, Canadians, and so forth that really enabled us to have these massive gatherings but also to support the grassroots activism in the field and <clears throat> I think we helped direct the media. I mean it, it, we have to acknowledge that this was I mean a very powerful issue because I mean you saw the film. The, the imagery, um, the voices of the survivors, the, the pictures of the rice fields <laughs> where you couldn't go. Bosnia, I mean, there were so many, Mozambique, Somalia, there were so many incredibly powerful images. It's not that easy to get that kind of imagery on other issues. And so it was easy to get media, but we got that. We initiated, we kept putting out a report after report after report, so new angles. I remember us sitting around going, okay, let's do a report on the economic impact, which we hadn't done early on. There were, there were reports on every kind of aspect to this, getting the religious community on board. In the US, we were able to, and it was easy, and I don't think we've done this since on, on, on many other issues, we got every major American medical association and specialty society to call for Bannon, and they've continued to stay with us on this, including just two years ago, signing a joint letter to President Obama uh, calling on him to sign the treaty in the course of the review that has been underway for some time under his administration. So th those were things that, that, that I think we should take credit for, but also there was certainly the right, the right moment. Before we move on, some quick, quick fire answers, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, a little soul searching, mistakes, regrets, things you would have done differently looking back over the past 20 years. Anybody? No. <laughs> regrets, you, you don't None. have a few. I don't believe in regrets. You learn from your errors and you move on. I, we, we changed the world. We got governments to do what they should have done anyway. You know? And that's still part of the thing that makes me agitated, that governments on their own should be following the law. They should not need us to stand up and form an international coalition like we just did to, to, to stop rape and gender violence in conflict. We're in the process of creating a campaign to stop killer robots before they are created, and I'm talking the Terminator. I'm not talking drones here. Government should be working on those issues on their own, and they won't unless people stand up and make them, and it gives me great pleasure to remember that we stood up and made them, and it made people around the world understand that everybody has power and we, if we work together in common cause, we can change this world. No regrets from Jody. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't do everything perfectly. And certainly, well, maybe you did. <laughs> well, not and, and we've learned. I mean, we've learned lessons. Uh, we have a new yeah. sister convention that you mentioned, uh, Stuart, the, the Convention on Cluster Munitions. And I mean, we, we've found out over the years, for example, that we didn't put enough pressure on countries to begin their demining efforts at the very beginning uh, of, of the 10-year period they were allowed under the Mine Ban Treaty. Uh, we maybe didn't do enough early on to, to ensure the rights of the victims. Uh, these are still things that we have to take care of uh, 20 years later, 15 years later after the treaty was, was uh And I was think signed. also early on we didn't, um, you know, we, the, the six founding members of the campaign very quickly realized that we really needed to have an international uh, a face, and uh, we were all um, European and North American, and so we, but we quickly fixed that, and that's why 11 groups shared in the prize and not the original six, um, uh, among, other, among other, other things, and we expand, I think we did a lot of tax, we may have spun in the first few years on this convention, on conventional weapons, probably we, we you know, I don't know if that's wasted time, but those were some things. Well, we, we were definitely not enough insistent on uh, the victim assistance side of things. But we corrected that uh, through the, the sisters treaty, as we say. Um, we have improved it. We realized that there was uh, much, well, and still we need more. 
because uh, we do lack uh, instruments of measure of the actual impact on the daily life of survivors. Uh, it's difficult to embrace in a treaty, but we certainly could have done better in the Ottawa. And the, the question of victim assistance is one I will return to. Nick, before we move on. I think, I, uh, you know, 20 years is a long time. And uh, there are many ups and downs that happen inside organizations and between organizations, and especially in civil society. We all know that. You know, we're a very dynamic sector, <laughs> shall we say. <clears throat> Uh, Mousty, I think, is the <laughs> and the and the uh, uh, it's not easy to hold together a campaign and a coalition over a, over such a long period of time. And I'm sure that there are things that uh, that all of us and each of us might have done differently in order to hold truer to the cause, in order to hold more focused on the objective and deli delivering right to the end. I'm not talking about the treaty, I'm talking about the continuing activity of the campaign. 20 years is a hell of a long time. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the things that our sector is sometimes very good at is um, spending more time discussing its differences than its commonalities. And uh, that may be an important thing to do, and it may be important to understand the differences, but if it distracts you from the focus of what you're trying to do together, then you weaken yourselves ultimately as a community, and I think we have to learn from that. Let's look at the, the present and the future now. Uh, I want to start by looking at the issue of, of universalization, completing the stamp album, if you like, getting everybody's names down on the list. If you've already got, as you often say, Steve, de facto compliance, if you've stigmatized these weapons to such an extent that no one is going to use them without international condemnation, how important is it to bring those holdout countries on board? At this point, I would say it's not our top priority. Uh, at this point in time, the, the humanitarian objectives of the convention, that is the demining and the, the victim assistance, take priority with the mine ban treaty over universalization. And that would be different for something like the Convention on Cluster Munitions, which is only a couple of years old and still needs a lot of push on universalization. But it's, it, it still is an important objective. I mean, there still are countries like the United States that are outside that should come on board, that can come on board, that I actually think will come on board. Mm. Uh, and there are others who um, it's entirely possible come on in, in uh, the near future. And we just got Finland, who's been holding out for 15 years to come on board. And Poland will do it uh, hopefully by the end of this year, another long time holdout. So uh, we're still getting some of those countries. And as we continue to try to strengthen the norm uh, uh, against this weapon, getting more and more countries still counts. Uh, so it, it needs to continue to be an activity that we engage in. One of the problems we have is, is that it's hard to keep people excited about universalization uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, oftentimes civil society has to, to, to bear the burden of pushing that forward. Um, but fear but is we have, I mean, we haven't, you know, we, there are still governments who are using anti-personnel mines. Syria, earlier this year, Burma continues to use the weapon. Last year, uh, Israel and Burma. Uh, use the weapon. Uh, so, you know, we're not there yet, and there's always danger points that uh, when you have renewed conflicts that you're going to see the weapons used because there are still large stockpiles out there. So it counts a lot. But fear is the number of countries coming on board, obviously, because of the early success of the treaty, is, has slowed considerably. Is there a point at which you say, we've gone as far as we can go, uh, let's put our efforts and our energies into something else and, 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 and close down the campaign or, or the campaign evolves or is folded into something else? Our ultimate objective is a mind-free world. Um, the compassion and the commitment, the energy that I see with this campaign, I think will not stop until we reach that goal, which means that all states are part of the treaty, ban landmines and get rid of all these um, uh, the, the landmines. So, but I agree with Steve that at this point, it's very important to, to focus on clearance, on victim assistance. It's not acceptable that it's still 12 people every day maimed and killed and injured by landmines. It's, it's the most painful part of this, this tragedy that's happening every day now. And that's obviously as, as a victim, I, I mean for everybody, but as a victim I really feel that. 
I'm going to part that victim assistance question for a second. We'll come back to that next. Has anybody got any out to add on universalisation? Uh, well, I think the the fact that um, yes. 20 states have declared themselves mines free is a tremendous achievement, and that's a wonderful thing. And as long as there are still new, we've just talked about new states who are signing, such as Poland and Finland and others. But as long as in that number of new states signing, there are countries like Somalia, uh, just recently, or there are, uh, who knows, uh, whether or not Myanmar will, uh, Burma will end up signing and, and uh, pursuing the interest that I understand it has shown in preliminary fashion. Um, as long as there are countries signing who have a need for this humanitarian outrage to be addressed, uh, then I don't think that there. I don't think that the ICBL has the right to take a decision to stop. Hmm. Uh, that's the issue. It's not our decision to stop. It's the. It's uh, as long as there are people who are feeling the need to sign to the treaty, so that they can seek and receive technical and financial assistance in addressing this problem. Is there a is danger of diminishing returns over time, and and the effort that it takes to keep keep the campaign together, to keep it energised and motivated? becomes more effort than the actual results coming, coming out the other side? I, uh, the, uh, I guess, I don't know, others will have a view on that, but I guess that there, there may be diminishing returns. That may be so, but it doesn't, uh, but it doesn't diminish the, uh, the cause, if you like, or the justice that is being sought by people who are having to live with these things. Well, there is also an element of uh, consistency um, one of the main features of this uh, campaign and this treaty is that it has been a treaty under civil society supervision. And uh, that uh, ongoing supervision calls for additional results. Otherwise, we would be just complacent. And uh, we, we just cannot, I, I agree, we shouldn't put that on the top priority, but we should make continue to make clear to everybody that we will not be satisfied as long as this treaty will not be universalized. I think the other, I think the other dimension to it, Stuart, if I may, is that over time, over 20 years, our understanding of the nature of the hazards which are faced by conflict-affected communities beyond only landmines has evolved. Of course it has, as a result of having been active in the campaign and as a result as operators of having been on the ground uh, trying to address uh, some of those needs. And so the evolution, the understanding of uh, the different hazards presented by, by uh, the explosive remnants of war of one kind or another, of the dangers presented by poorly managed stockpiles, the dangers presented by small arms and light weapons. You know, our understanding by engaging with this has become more sophisticated of what people are having to endure. And that's not going away. So we need to be intelligent about how we adapt ourselves to an improved understanding of what people's needs are as they emerge from conflict as well. Susan. I, mean, I guess speaking as an American, I mean, I, I have always felt uh, with quite some passion that it is really important for the U.S. to sign and for those of us in the United States to continue to press our own government. It's, it's a message uh, to the world that uh, our government cares, recognizes the egregiousness of this weapon, uh, recognizes the harm the weapon causes, <coughs> continues to cause to uh, men, women, and children all over the world. And um, as we know, the U.S. Has a very, takes a very long time to sign most international treaties. It took us 40 years to sign the Genocide Convention. Um, and, and, you know, as Lloyd Axworthy said, the Foreign Minister of Canada, um, around the time, I believe, of the Ottawa Treaty, he said that, you know, this campaign has um, uh, uh, made it impossible to ignore NGOs and that NGOs are now um, the way that decisions have to be made. And he said, they've been the voice saying governments belong to the people and must respond to the people's demands and ideals. And I believe that we need to hold our government uh, accountable that way. And um, I, I, for one, was, was you know, distressed in Ottawa at the same time that I was elated, being an American, sitting there just north of the border, um, and seeing this joy and celebration at this new international norm with the U.S. outside. And you know, while it's important to recognize that because of not signing, the U.S. gave probably more money um, to um, 
to uh, you know treating victims and to um, demining, which is a good thing. Uh, we still need the U.S. there, and then we need Russia and China eventually before this this campaign um, should should fold up. And, and given that we are just a few weeks uh, uh, from a presidential election here in the U.S., do you have any analysis or, or reflections, predictions of how uh, the result of that election may affect uh, the U.S.'s position on the Mine Ban Treaty? Susanna. Well, I think, you know, we've been very hopeful, as Steve said, um, that uh, the Obama government um, would uh, get closer to signing the treaty. Uh, there is a review underway. It's been going on for some time. We have, have had indications that uh, the administration would like to uh, move closer to join or join the treaty. Uh, I was remembering this week how um, in a previous election, uh, the U.S. campaigners went to Iowa and we had a logo that made a, a corn uh, a stock and, a, and a, an ear of corn look like a mine and um, we were trying to get this to be a, a, an issue in the elections. I don't think landmines is going to be very high on the foreign policy debate uh, in a couple of days, but uh, that being said, I think you know we could hope uh, that um, in, an, in uh, uh, a follow-on Obama administration, um, we, we could get a ban. Steve may have um, Steve, uh, more detail on that, but uh, it's something that you know, we could hope for. Your feelings about how the presidential not, not, election Not more hope necessarily, but, um, but certainly I think the opportunity is there. They undertook a serious review starting in late 2009 and lasted till early this year. Uh, importantly, the review was aimed at identifying the obstacles to joining the mine ban treaty and trying to find ways to overcome them. We know that a lot of good things happened during the course of this review and that it had reached the decision point uh, earlier this year. And it appears that that decision was put off largely for political reasons, uh, election season. Uh, and we're hopeful that uh, if the Obama administration uh, serves another term that we will hear at least positive developments. Whether or not we would hear that they're ready to uh, submit the treaty to the Senate for its advice and consent, I'm not sure we'd go that far, but certainly positive developments. The, the Romney campaign has not said anything about landmines. It has not been an issue, so we don't really know, although some of us could probably imagine what the result might be. All right, let's move on to that question of victim assistance. Um, Jean-Baptiste, Article 6 of the Mine Ban Treaty says each country in a position to do so is obligated to assist in the care and rehabilitation of mine victims. Isn't the problem, though, that many of the most mine countries of the world aren't in a position to, to assist the victims to the extent that you would hope? Well, again, we are touching base here with the, uh, the um, underlying spirit of that uh, treaty um, negotiated um, in the name of the victims and the survivors and the affected community. And obviously, um, the spirit of the treaty is a demanding solidarity amongst the parties to the treaty. But this is a, a vague concept. There is no rules um, regulating it. And, um, and there is another issue, which is, uh, should we earmark carbon-14, the victims of landmines, or should we uh, uh, accept to uh, accommodate uh, victims of a road accident at the same time. So a public health approach demands that you do not duplicate services, otherwise you, you exactly hamper what you're supposed to support. So um, there have been uh, tremendous and at times tough discussions with the, all the uh, involved governments to, to find the right trick to support public health services uh, and at the same time not stigmatizing and uh, sidelining those victims because there is no way that you separate them from the rest of the population. So it is a challenge, uh, it's, it's ongoing, it's uh, improving, but still there are a lot to be done and it's not only a question of uh, feeding prosthetics as you may guess, it's also a huge challenge of inclusion. And uh, considering the problem as a social issue and an economic issue for individuals, family, and the community at large. So it's complex. Do you want to pick up that issue? I'm particularly thinking, as, as John Baptiste says, about 
issues of inclusion, about stigmatization of, of, of people with disabilities generally, and some of the, the psychosocial needs of, of victims as well as the, the prosthetic needs of, of victims. Look, victim assistance is all about human rights. There are two elements in victim assistance. One is which is very important is that People, because they are victim, because they are survivor, they should not be discriminated. I believe that every each country has some or in some position to support their citizen. If there is a school, they should make sure that the survivors and victims are able to 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 go and benefit from this school equally as other students. That's all about victim assistance. And then there is another part which is the special needs be provided for victims and landmine survivors. That's one of the challenging part. But I, I believe, and I think many of our, uh, my fellows and, and colleagues agree that there has been some progress in terms of physical rehabilitation. NGOs, ICRC played a good role, but also the governments. There has been some very good progress in terms of uh, improving the understanding of the states, the UN, the, everyone, what is victim assistance, what, is, what, are the, what do we mean really by the, uh, do we mean by victim assistance, what are the needs of survivors, which is itself, it helped to create some sort of, to improve, improve a political will within the country, within the capital. And how accurate do you think current assessments of the number of victims are? I mean, are you confident that you have a firm grasp on, on, on the number of victims everywhere, or do you think there are still a large number of victims who, who go and report it? I think there are a large number of victims that are unreported. And the, the, the information system in many countries, victims are in developing countries, and in, in developing countries, the information system is quite poor. And we don't get most of the, the, um, the victims recorded. Those who are survivors, some of them are recorded, but some of them are not. Some of them moved from one country to a developed country, and they are not at all in the system. So that's why we, we say that uh, thousands of, of uh, survivors and victims. And victims include family members of survivors, which is quite a huge number. Jean-Baptiste and Nick, how do you persuade governments to, to commit funds, given that, that there are these, these gaps in your knowledge of, of the extent of the problem? Can I just add uh, a, a, a brief comment? Um, the supposedly, I mean, estimated number of 500,000 survivors um, is growing every year, even if at a lower pace. And it's not counting a family where the head of the family died. So, I mean, the statistics are extremely misleading and do not translate into real terms the daily ordeal of uh, millions of people in uh, affected uh, countries, plus those who are still living under the threat of the accident, which is another uh, detrimental effect of the mine pollution. How do we convince the donors? Um, well, by um, offering uh, them uh, as good as possible project to be funded, um, evidence-based, um, more and more sophisticated in terms of uh, um, engineering uh, community support for the disabled people, uh, better integration in the community, and a better return on investment. But one of the danger is the latest of the donors community, value for money, for God's sake. I would like to know what value for money would really mean to confront that to the ordeal of the victims and survivors. Nick, do you, do you sense that it's getting more difficult to persuade governments to commit funds? Are they asking for uh, a measure of value for money that, that it is very difficult to provide? Yes, it's certainly. And I'm not talking about, and Mag is not directly engaged in, although very supportive of the whole victim assistance agenda, but, but as a clearance operator, um, it is uh, more and more the case, yes, that people are wanting to understand very precisely what is the long-term impact which is being 
uh, generated and what are the short-term outputs that are being generated and what's the unit cost and what's the cost per square meter and so on and so forth, which often for us is frustrating and doesn't take account of the very, very different terrains and the very different uh, uh, environment that we're operating in. So there are frustrations around that agenda. At the same time, I think that we as an operator, that MAG as, as an operator on the ground, has to constantly be pushing itself to try to develop technology, to try to develop approaches, to have a uh, to have a focus. I mean, we know that there are, sadly, uh, limited and finite resources out there to support this work, and we have to find ways, not because we're being told to by others, but because we know that we've got to make these resources go as far as they can to, uh, to eliminate as much of the problem as we are able to do so with the resources available. So the, pr the, the push to improve our technology, to improve our practice, to improve our methodologies, and to be pragmatic about what we can achieve is, is, a, is a difficult one because it's a balancing act constantly but of how to get the most out of what's available whilst recognizing that it's finite. So we, uh, the pressure is on for sure. There's not enough resources in the system uh, to, to address the nature of the problem that still exists around the world with hundreds of million, uh, with 100 million mines still in the ground, I think. Um, and it'll take decades to do that, decades and decades to do that. So either the resources have to be increased or the technology has to be improved or the methodologies have to be adjusted uh, because we ca we ca we, uh, all of those things is really what has to happen so that we Just can start right. to make faster progress. Well, I mean, it's not only frustration. It's, it's at times it's anger. Absolutely. Because uh, one should not forget that uh, such a treaty is, an, at first, a self-amnesty. It's a time where everybody put the gun on the table uh, in a, well, looking forward. But they did refuse to get any liability for the past. They just committed, the, the parties to the treaty committed themselves to do their utmost to clear the earth and help the victims. And um, that's what we are here to continue to demand. And I think somebody said that, you know, the nature of the obligations is that they are comprehensive and that they are unqualified. And so the commitments are absolute. Uh, uh, the, the, the problem is that the resources are finite and the, the commitment to deliver them is insufficient to the scale of the task, really, for us. Curious, so that's what we have to push it's a different at. different way to look at it. That's mm. what we have to push at. Funding levels have been at record highs for years on end. Uh, and it's highly unlikely there are 100 million mines in the ground. Highly unlikely there were ever 100 million mines in the ground, much less that there's still 100 million mines what in the ground. Whatever the scale of the problem statistic is, statistic that, that, that the UN made up in, in 1993 that we made a lot of use of, but was probably never accurate, and highly unlikely that it's accurate now. Um, and I don't think it's going to take decades and decades, certainly maybe to clear certain border areas or something else. Did but you know when you were using that figure close. that it wasn't necessarily accurate? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we, 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 we thought it probably was accurate. And, and we, we went very carefully, country by country, with the estimates of how we got to a total like that. But it, it, it came from people thinking that there were 20 million anti-personnel mines in Angola, uh, and more than that in Cambodia and in other countries. So we, we went through a, a serious process, but those have all proven to be overestimates. But the job is far from finished in Angola, yes, no question and about that. there is already uh, some signs of donor disengagement from it, and the job is not done. So, yeah. so what's going to happen? That's the challenge we face. One of the elements how to keep uh, the international resources mobilized and keep the donors excited is that some, most of the donors, or, or at least the UN system and other uh, bilateral donors, they really um, support if the, the landmine and victim assistance is included in the national priority. For example, if it's included in the health priority of a country, then that fund will go through the, um, to, to, to victims. So what I'm saying is it's very important for affected countries that to keep clearance victim assistance among the priority, not the priority perhaps, but among the priority in health system, in education, in accessibility, in clearance, in development, in poverty reduction. So that will help, that will uh, mobilize resources. Not resources by donors, but also by the national budget and national development budget. 
Susanna, did you want to come in? I, I just wanted to add a, about the data and statistics. I mean, uh, speaking for Physicians for Human Rights, we're, we always look at numbers and are fairly careful in, uh, about throwing them around. And as soon as we started to think that maybe that 100 million number might be wrong, we, we moved pretty quickly to a range and we cited the sources and I think that's very important for that campaign and all future campaigns not to not to play fast and loose with, with the data. Um, but in terms of also this issue about you know how to continue to get funds and to galvanize attention, I think one thing that is important to point out that in, in recent years we now have a new treaty on disability rights and um, like many um, sort of single issue or if you want to call it you know, disease we, in the medical world, we talk about single disease campaigns that are moving now to integrate. So in many countries where there is also new, hopefully new funding for the rights and support for the disabled across board, we have other kinds of war disabled in many countries, not just from landmines and so forth. That may be a way that this campaign has to, and it already is and has, but will continue to move um, to think about um, this problem, but in a larger public health and development of health systems and international aid. Definitely, there is a need for to synergize our efforts with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Personally, I see the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability as future of victim assistance. Mm -hmm. exactly. Maybe not in a few exactly. years, but uh, that's ultimately the yeah. providing overarching mechanism for rights of all people with disability, including landmine survivors. For those watching online and those in the audience, we've got about five minutes. If you've got any questions you want to submit on Twitter, I've got some here, and I will return to those as we reach towards the end in about five minutes' time. A couple of quick questions. Nick, uh, we touched on that issue of, of donor fatigue, of how difficult it's becoming to, to attract donors. You, uh, you at MAG have started to diversify into, into other areas, into areas like, like, like weapons and small arms. Is that signaling a shift away from your... your core reason that you were set up to get rid of landmines? No, not at all. Uh, the major focus of our work continues to be around humanitarian mine action and, and it must continue to be. Uh, but what it, what it signals, I think, is just a, a, a broadening understanding of the contribution that we can make in conflict-affected communities uh, to address uh, a wider range of their needs rather than only the issue of the landmines that may be the anti-personnel landmines that may be in the ground. Uh, and that we have to approach a community and its priorities in a broader, more intelligent way than that. Uh, and, and, uh, and countries which are emerging from conflict, there is a, there is a broader contribution we can make. I think the danger uh, with it um, from this broadening analysis, which donors also have of conflict-affected uh, environments and how they may program into it, whether it's called stabilization or whether it's called um, different aspects of security sector reform or rule of law or whatever it may be is that if mine action is mainstreamed into uh, a broader analysis then uh, some of the dedicated resources that are available may just become subsumed and I think that is the danger with it that actually this broadening analysis if donors have it that prevention is better than cure uh, of large stockpile explosions or whatever else it may be, then it needs dedicated resources to address it. Small arms and light weapons needs dedicated resources to address it. It can't be at the expense of mine action that this broadening uh, analysis is met. And I think that's the challege for operators and for donors likewise. Jean-Baptiste, do you ever feel a, 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 a pressure to, to shift the focus in the brief of, of your organization depending on, on what donors are asking you for at any particular time? I'm not sure I got the question. Do you, uh, given that we're discussing the issue of, of diversifying uh, organizations' um, role and the organizations' needs, do you, do you at Handicap International ever sense that you, that you well, have to keep up with the times, if you like, and what donors are asking? We're, we're, we're slightly special in this. Uh, first, the disability issue is a cross-cutting cross issue, uh, be it in emergency or development or reconstruction. Uh, plus the fact that we have embarked on a global approach to, uh, in mine action, being one of the uh, um, mine clearance operators as much as uh, um, feeding people and mine risk education and uh, whatever uh, economic and social uh, projects to accompany survivors. So um, we are involved in all components of the cycle. 
Um, so we don't we don't see ourselves being uh, pushed uh, in in either either direction, but definitely um, again I think that um, we must push the donors community to remain up to their commitment, um, and um, it's not it's not acceptable just to say there are limited resources. I mean the resources are direct representation of political will. Let's um, ask uh, some of the questions that come in from Twitter, and I'll, I'll, I'll open them to anybody who wants to, to, to comment. First question, what lessons do you think the Ottawa process has uh, for efforts to, in, in other disarmament forums, in, in nuclear weapons and, and, and other areas of disarmament? Anybody want to comment on that? Sure. I mean, one of the things that we haven't really talked about very much uh, this evening uh, are coming some of the bigger picture issues that have emerged from this campaign something we oftentimes call citizen diplomacy uh, and, and a related uh, uh, phenomenon that we sometimes call humanitarian disarmament. Uh, when the Nobel Committee gave the prize to the campaign and to Jody, it cited a new diplomacy. It cited a new way of mobilizing public opinion and mobilizing governments uh, to come together around a humanitarian focus. And that was put forward as a potential model for future activities. And indeed, it, it did become uh, a model for many different uh, organizations and campaigns. Most recently and most notably, the, the Cluster Munition Coalition that resulted, uh, that, that pushed forward the Convention on Cluster Munitions, but we also saw it in the campaign to create the International Criminal Court and Child Soldiers and uh, a, a range of, of others. And it's a diplomacy where civil society has a prominent voice, where it essentially sets the agenda brings an issue before governments uh, and makes it a, a global priority, and then working with governments seeks a common solution. All the time, though, civil society having uh, an um, integrated role into how the issue is addressed. And it's this partnership between NGOs, civil society more broadly, and progressive governments and international organizations, in this case especially the International Committee of the Red Cross, and very importantly, UN agencies. It's the partnership of, of that constellation of actors that has made the landmine campaign successful and it has also made the cluster munition campaign successful. Then the humanitarian disarmament uh, aspect of it, again, focuses on the degree to which you can have this partnership come together uh, in such a way that you approach disarmament issues from a new focus. That is, you don't put narrow national military interests to the forefront. You put humanitarian interests and protection of civilians uh, to the forefront. And you look uh, through the solution from that prism, not from the narrow national interest. And this has been successful, most notably, with landmines and cluster munitions. But it could work. Uh, and should be an approach that you can adopt or adapt for other issues uh, as well. Jody, citizen diplomacy as a model for other campaigns, both in the disarmament sphere and, and elsewhere. Any time I'm around a group of NGOs that are confused about how to move forward, I, it just, I wanna give them the handbook about how we did it in the landmine campaign. And I don't mean, sometimes when I say that to NGOs, they say, but it's not, about, it's not as easy as banning landmines. And they're missing the whole point. The point is that when organizations come together, set a goal, and move forward together in a, in a concerted strategy and coordination so that everybody knows what's happening, you can change the world so much more quickly. But some goals are going to be more achievable than others. You know, I think that's a, a, something that people say when they're, excuse me, but defeatist. I think anything can be changed in this world if enough people get up off their butts and join efforts to change them. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when Susanna and I were at a series of meetings talking about impunity and, you know, sexual violence, for example, 
And we sat through two or three different meetings at different times, and finally we were out shopping. <laughs> and um, just gently shopping, but we were shopping. And then we just said, looked at each other and said, you know, there are organizations doing great work in you know, different countries and different you know, ways to try to address the problem of violence against women, gender-based violence and conflict. But why don't we get them together in a campaign? Because if we're in a campaign, we can move it forward better. Same thing in our new effort to stop killer robots. It's the same thinking. And this one's a little more like landmines because it's coming out of the nether. I mean, landmines, nobody was working on it. And you know we created this campaign to deal with an issue nobody was really dealing with in a political sense. Um, but I see resistance sometimes, and I don't understand it. It's like people are afraid if they become part, part of a coalition, their own individual creativity is somehow going to be you know, taken away from them. Or you know, there's still a little too much ego out there. Instead of understanding, like one of the wonders of the landmine campaign and the cluster munition, which I did very little work in, was the creativity that was unleashed mm -hmm. by virtue of being part of a huge global network where you knew you know, people who were good at being in suits and talking to the governments were doing that part. And people who were better at you know, doing petition campaigns were out doing that part. And people who were creative and wanted to do the minefield so the diplomats had to walk across it. It, it just... It, w it was such an amazing thing. And when I think back on the campaign, um, I think about that a lot. And I do think about, despite the fact, I think there could have been more and better use of this model to deal with many issues. I know that people around the world truly believe that they can make a difference. You know, I get so many emails and, you know, they're from people of all walks of life, just saying thank you for what you all did in the landmine campaign. You made me understand that, that I have a role to play, that I can join with others and bring about change in the world. And uh, that's going to be one of the things Susan, I've been most proud about Susan, in my any, life. Any lessons uh, from Ottawa for other campaigns? You yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we have to remember that when we started the campaign, and I know I was one of the skeptics when Jody came and said, can Physicians for Human Rights join? And I. I was like, ban, call for a global ban. We're just going to be laughed out of the room. This was the, one of the most wide, widely used and cheapest weapons in the world, um, conventional weapons. And, and so now we can look back and think, oh, well, that was easy because, it, in fact, it was so rapid. But when you look at the campaign on sexual violence that we're now uh, working on, we're, in a way, at the same phase. And I think Jody's absolutely right that we have to... Um, have the vision that we indeed can change reality, that we can't accept reality as it is when people's rights and people's bodies and minds are being harmed by their governments and, and by really malign forces. And, and, and so the, and the lessons that we've learned from the campaign also include a step-by-step -step approach to change, early wins. We didn't think we would have the treaty at the beginning, but we had one win after another after another, and, and these, you know, there are many battles that we're still fighting. The campaign against torture, that's gone on for decades, but those of us in the room, I'm sure everyone in the room has a vision of a world where torture doesn't exist. And we have a vision of a world where women and men are not raped. And, and you know, we have to cling to that and, and think about the practicality. So, you know, I think of it as practical idealism. That's yeah. That's what we had. We've uh, only got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to rattle through a couple of quick questions that come in on Twitter. So please keep your answers short if you wouldn't mind. What's the future of traditional, traditional multilateral disarmament diplomacy done via the UN process? Is that dying? Steve? <laughs> Bear in mind the audience here. <laughs> I have a little answer. Jody? I think it should die if it continues to operate under consensus because that gives any one country a veto and that is not how to create international law for all. I mean, what we've seen, the most successful uh, uh, disarmament uh, movements of the past two decades have been humanitarian disarmament oriented. 
not through traditional uh, ways of doing business. That doesn't mean that traditional ways can't have some successes, um, but uh, there should be great skepticism. And uh, the lessons that should be learned by diplomats and others is that you need to involve civil society, you need to keep humanitarian concerns to the forefront. Uh, are there some traditional fora, like the Conference on Disarmament, that could go away without there being much result? I think the answer is yes. Sorry if there are any CD ambassadors in the room, but when you, go, when you go a couple of decades without really accomplishing anything, then maybe you should rethink your existence. Jean-Baptiste, diplomacy as usual. <laughs> well, it, it's clear that the, the, the main breakthrough came uh, with the decision of some uh, uh, brave countries to take the lead with the support of the organized civil society. And that was the good mix. Um, it has proved to be the good mix, and I think it should be uh, followed to continue to prove to be the good mix on other issues. And I'm not sure that the UN system is adapted to that, and I'm not even sure that it is meant for that. Um, what I will also say is that um, one of the features of this campaign has been uh, the tremendous help of new technology but not only. It's also because we all got to use to come together, touch each other, um, embrace each other, support each other, listen to each other, and enjoy to be together. And I don't think that any uh, Twitter campaign will never replace that absolute need to feel uh, human beings coming together to share a common goal and to overcome all the hurdles and difficulties and to recover from setbacks and to strike back and continue and think and brainstorm again and invent, be creative and inventing even pyramid of shoes. I mean, I, I <laughs> you saw them on, on the film. I mean, I don't know who exactly invented that the concept of pyramid of shoes where you, people are invited to throw shoes in a, an outraged gesture. But that works very well and continues to work for the 18th year in a row. We just had it two weeks ago and people were telling us to not give up. So. Oh, we're out of time. Uh, some closing thoughts from all of you, if you wouldn't mind. As, as we mark the 20th anniversary of the ICPL, what would your message for all of you be to people who weren't there at the start, people who are coming to this campaign <laughs> now that is, is in, a, in, a, in a position of some maturity? Why should people care about the campaign who, who are coming to it now fresh? I'm going to say the same thing that used to irritate my colleagues uh, long ago. I, I would hope people would join the landmine campaign, but to me that's not the most important thing. Whatever gives you passion to change, whether it's the environment or stopping the tar sands or women's issues or whatever, get up off your butt, join an organization working on it and volunteer. I started as a volunteer about 30, 40 years ago. Even if it's an hour a week, I, I have this vision of all good-hearted people who want to change the world for everybody's benefit, including our own, gave one hour a month or one hour a week, imagine what this world would be. And yes, many of you who want to be part of the landmine campaign, that'd be great too. Firoz, how do, you, how do you convince people to get involved with your campaign as it celebrates its 20th anniversary? As we say, there are over 70 countries is still affected by landmines. There are millions of stock mines are stocked. There are over 4,000 people killed every year. It's not about individuals, about their family, about the community. It's the number is huge. So there is clearly a, a, a clear need to, to, to be involved in the campaign, to, be in, or to, to ban landmines and to make sure that uh, we get rid of uh, landmines and address the rights of victims. And just to add that, on. Um, one of the beauty of this campaign is the diversity of this campaign. It's not a top-down campaign. It's not only a bunch of Western and white people here. It's about the, you know, we're present in 100 countries and from all, from all different parts of the world. I think that's one of the lessons, very good lessons to, that can be replicated in, in different areas. Anyone else want to do very quickly? If you want to... Yeah, I think, um, 
It's about the importance of collaboration and cooperation and building alliances. It's not only what you're fighting for, although that's extremely important, that's the reason that brings people to the table, but it's what you benefit from being a part of that process. It's what you're able to contribute to others, either as an individual or organizationally, but it's also what you're able to uh, take and learn from others, either as an individual or organizationally. And uh, it's, not all, it's not all giving and it's not all taking, uh, but the process is one that both helps to achieve the goals and is enriching to, to one's own organization if one stays the course. Steve? Yeah, I, I think Jody gave the right answer, uh, especially for young people, in, in that uh, it's not so important that you care about landmines, it's important that you care about something, and that you dedicate yourself to it and that you try to bring something to the common good. But in terms of landmines, obviously the job is not done, so that's one reason why you should continue to, to, to be drawn to the campaign. But in my view, because the ICBL is seen as a model, because the Mine Ban Treaty is seen as one of the great successes in disarmament and in humanitarian law of the past two decades, if the ICBL fails, if the Mine Ban Treaty fails, then humanitarian disarmament fails and citizen diplomacy fails and the power of civil society is undermined. So it's important that people stick with this. So just briefly, I, I think it's really important, one lesson that, that we all can take um, is that we have treaties, we have governments that are obligated to uphold the rights and safety and well-being of their citizens, but it is always the responsibility of citizens to claim those rights, and that's what this is all about. Thank you. Jean Baptiste. Well, uh, <laughs> if I was uh, 20 or 30, I think I would embrace this campaign uh, happily, wholeheartedly, um, because of everything which has been achieved is meaningful, and because it's quite understandable, as Steve just said, that it deserves uh, particular attention so that this concept of a people's treaty is not uh, finishing uh, in uh, the, I would say, the bureaucracy of, uh, uh, or lack of commitment of uh, governments and the United System. So if I was 20 or 30, I would start again from scratch. I want to close by reading a, a quote that has been used to describe the international uh, campaign to ban landmines. It's, it's been called a rich and bubbling stew of civil society, diplomats, disarmament advocates, crisis mitigation groups, and others. And uh, it would seem, looking around the room this evening, that that rich stew is also evident in the room this evening. And I hope it <laughs> continues to bubble as we uh, adjourn this evening and uh, get off our butts, as Jody would say, and go and enjoy a drink. So before we do, please thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists, Jody Williams, Steve Goose, Firoz Ali Alizade, Jean-Baptiste Richardier, Nick Rosevere, and Susanna Serkin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.